All right, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Living Better podcast. And today we have an exciting guest. This is an interview I've been personally looking forward to. We are with Dr. Mary Party. She is a, well, she's part of the Functional um, Health Institute. I just got to get it right. And she is a doctor. A uh, gut doctor, sorry, my bad. And she specializes in uh, gut health and the gut brain uh, health. And she sees clients to optimize that on a regular basis via meetings like we're doing today. And people can reach out to you when they have certain issues. So today we're going to try to bring awareness to what it, what the gut is and what it does for the body. Because a lot of people don't know that it's very, like it's a big organ that has a lot of function for the body. So before we dive into this, what about you introduce yourself, your background, and what got you to being a gut doctor and being interested in gut health, ultimately, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a naturopathic medical doctor and a functional medicine doctor as well. And um, I really came to the profession based on my own gut issues, which is really what draws a lot of people to the medical or health field is, uh, you know, they had some sort of personal experience with it, especially, especially more like the holistic health world. Um, because people usually come to us because they've gone to conventional doctors that were covered by insurance and they just haven't gotten the answers that they're looking for or answers at all about why they don't feel well on a daily basis. And so I had gut issues growing up bloating, constipation, typical like IBS symptoms, which, you know, the majority of Americans, a lot of Americans have these. It's about, you know, 20%, but I actually think it's much, much higher than that. It's just underreported, underdiagnosed. And, um, and so I went through the whole conventional model and finally a doctor was like, Hey, listen, you're just going to have to live with this. There's nothing else that we can do. You've tried every medication, you know, see you later kind of thing. And I left the appointment just in tears and feeling so defeated. Um, Mm. And just feeling like I didn't have somebody on my team either. It was more like him versus me. It was a very strange dynamic. And from that point on, I was like, I really want to become that doctor that I didn't have as a younger girl. And so that's what I've done is really just dived into the research and finding evidence-based things that have research to support it. Um, but the research hasn't hit clinical practice yet or is a little bit more alternative and there isn't research for it, but it works when you do it. So evidence-based medicine, some people think it has to be research-backed. And while I love having research behind things, sometimes there just isn't the research yet. For instance, we've known that vitamin D is so essential for health. Why wait for the research to be there to implement like optimal levels versus just not getting rickets? And so some of it is going ahead of the research, but also just staying up to date with what is there because clinical application and clinical results are very much pertinent and considered evidence-based medicine. If you've seen it work over and over again, then I consider that evidence. It's just not in the research yet. Yeah, definitely. Um, So that's what I do on a daily basis. I help women, men with gut as well as hormone issues. I have an anti-aging branch because I'm really passionate about performance. I came from the performance physiology world before, just really optimizing health in every level. Yeah, that's awesome. So how long did you have those uh, gut issues uh, and then you try to sort it out? And how bad did they get to really bother you to the point that you were seeking uh, some, something to fix it? Yeah, so um, I had them my entire life, like as okay. a little tiny baby up until the age of about 25, 26 zero symptoms now. Um, IBS is not a life-threatening condition. And so it does kind of get swept under the carpet. But when you look at the quality of life with people with severe IBS, it's actually similar to people of end-stage kidney failure. Um, And so that is what's really important to me is, you know, do you feel your best on a daily basis, even though you're not in a life-threatening situation, quality of life is so important. You know, you want to live your best life and feel good and energize. And when your gut doesn't feel good, your mood is off. You can have anxiety, depression, just kind of a feeling of hopelessness, which I was definitely in that situation. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I just really want to empower people and also make people feel understood. Like, yes, you don't have a life-threatening condition, but I can feel that you're not living your best life right now. And we need to get you to the place where you feel good enough to pursue your dreams, your passions. Yes. 
And that's why I wanted you on the podcast so we can discuss that. So we can educate people on gut health because people don't know how important it is and how many yeah. roles does it have within your body? Mm. Uh, it plays with hormones. It plays with immune system. It plays with so many things. So this is where I want you to maybe bring it down or dumb it down to explain it to everybody in a way that people can understand how important is the gut. Yeah. And so in naturopathic medicine, we have a tenant that says, basically, if you don't know where to start, start with the gut, because the gut is connected to every other organ system. The body is really an entire symphony. So if you yeah. don't have one instrument playing at full force, the whole symphony is going to be affected. And I think that's really important. And that's what conventional medicine is starting to catch on with now, because how the traditional medical model is created is that we have somebody that just looks at the gut, somebody that just looks at the hormones, somebody that just looks at the brain, right? Neurologist. Yeah. Somebody, we have all these specialties, um, but that's not how the body works. The body works Separate as an entire everything. system. Yeah. yeah. Everything has to be in conjunction, yeah. um, which makes it more difficult because then as a doctor, you need to understand all of the systems, which is why specialties are so important still, because if you have a kidney issue, you really need something somebody that has studied kidney issues for years and years and years and years, right, to focus in. But we do need practitioners to be looking more at a comprehensive picture of the person yeah. and not their condition or their organ system alone. And so in gut health and integrative gastro, yes, we're looking at the gut, but we're also looking at how hormones influence it. I'm always looking at thyroid function and female cycles. We're talking about anxiety and depression because it's a bi-directional system. Right. Um, your gut affects your brain, but your brain affects your gut. And so they play onto each other. And this is with every other organ system too. Your gut is going to affect metabolism in the liver. Metabolism in the liver is going to affect the gut. Um, mm -hmm. But your gut is really the place where you start to digest and absorb your food, right? So it's also the place where you get nourishment from. Yeah. And you need vitamins and minerals to support all of the functions in all of your cells. And so I often tell people in America, most Americans are overfed but undernourished. Yeah. And the gut is where that really starts to happen is how many micronutrients are you taking in is your body able to digest and absorb them to get the full effect of those foods that you're consuming? Yeah. Okay. And um, so would you say that a lot of the issues that people have are nutrition related? And if so, what's the big issue in terms of nutrition nowadays, maybe compared to before, or have you seen an increase in gut health problems um, lately? Yeah. And unfortunately the people that end up coming to me are typically already on a whole foods diet. They're already eating tons of vegetables. They've cut out processed foods. They're not eating dairy. You know, they've even taken out gluten and they're eating super, super clean already. Yeah. And so the, the population that comes to see me is not representative of the standard American diet. And I would okay. love to see more of those people reaching out for help because we can see dramatic changes in nutrition alone. So my background is in nutrition. I went okay. got my undergraduate in nutrition. I did some nutritional counseling before. Yeah. And so I really think that food is medicine. I think we could get rid of a ton of chronic diseases um, with nutrition alone. Um, there's also the opposite end of the spectrum, which is typically the clients that come to see me. They have everything dialed in. They're overanalyzing every food choice that they make. They're obsessed that there must be a one food in their diet that's causing the bloating, the constipation, the diarrhea. And they've gone to the side of the spectrum where we consider it more like orthorexia, which is a fear of food and over obsession about being healthy. Yeah. So health is a spectrum and we want to be somewhere in the middle where, yes, we care about our health. We're choosing the healthy foods. We're eating a plant-based diet with tons of vitamins, minerals packed into those plants. Um, but if we fall off the wagon and we have a slice of pizza once in a while, we don't kill ourselves about it because that guilt, that shame, that judgment, that affects our health more than the slice of pizza. Yeah. And so I try to tell people about this, but it gets to like mindful eating and really just a healthy relationship with food is so much more important than being so strict on your nutrition that you're actually taking a few steps back. Okay. That being said, if my population was the general public and the standard American diet, 
You can prevent and reverse diabetes. You can get rid of cholesterol, heart issues. You can do so much with nutrition alone if yeah. you haven't already tapped into that category. And yeah. so with everything going on with COVID and you know the pandemic, yeah, yeah. I wish the message was more about like how do we empower people so that they're not scared to get a life-threatening infection because they're so sure that their body can take care of it. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's circumstances that we can't, you know, control. But in the large, you know, if you look at the big scope of this virus, most of the people that are getting severe illness have at least one chronic disease. And I really think that's where nutrition comes in. Yes. Lifestyle exercise is preventing chronic disease. Yes. So connecting both being an expert in gut health obviously is related to nutrition. I don't know, maybe primarily nutrition, um, what would you say people can do to improve their gut health with their nutrition uh, coming from performance background? Uh, yeah. What yeah. can general people do to improve that to start with? Yes. Yeah. So I have kind of a baseline elimination diet for gut health. And what okay. it includes is taking out grains, taking out dairy, taking out processed foods, which is like your chips, your bagels, like anything that doesn't look like you couldn't pick it or, you know, find it in nature is processed foods. So taking out all of those things, including nuts, and nuts is the big one that people forget with gut health because bloating, constipation, and diarrhea, nuts can make that worse. So that's the one healthy food that I do take out of people's diets. And this is short term though. So I'm not doing this for the rest of their lives. And that's the key. And you also have to read the person. If this person has a history of an eating disorder or is overly restrictive already, it's not for them and they have to work with somebody special. But for the general public, like really taking out those foods, which leaves you with three quarters of your plate is vegetables. You know, in gut health, I tell people try to do cooked vegetables, soups and stews, things that are easy on the GI tract if yeah. constipation, bloating, or you know, any of the even reflux are difficult for you because you're taking out some of the work for your gut. So if you're eating like pre-digested foods, things that are mashed or cooked, steamed, pureed, um, your gut's going to be a little bit more happy with you because it has to do less work. Um, This is only for about 30 days and then you want to reintroduce a lot of these foods to see if you can tolerate them. So sometimes I'll have people take out eggs and eggs have so many health benefits, including choline. You mentioned your wife. Um, but you know, really making sure that women have enough choline to have a healthy baby, healthy pregnancy is so essential. Um, so that's why you want to reintroduce these foods so that you can see, okay, you can tolerate it. And I just have to keep out dairy and nuts for a little while and then I'll heal my gut. So the idea is to go in, heal the gut, and then you should be able to eat pretty much anything that's considered healthy. Some people say, hey, I have all these intolerances. I can't tolerate fried food. I can't tolerate ice cream. I can't tolerate pizza. You know, that, those aren't intolerances. Those are just a normal human body reacting adversely to unhealthy foods. Yeah. So an intolerance in my mind is I can't eat broccoli. I can't eat sweet potatoes. I can't eat salmon. Like I get, out, like I get reactions to all of these healthy foods. That's when there's something wrong. And you, go, okay. you have to go in and heal the gut at that. Point. When you're reacting to just junk, <laughs> junk food, food the answer yeah. is take the junk food out. I never tell people, yeah, let's try to reintroduce, you know, ice cream into your diet. That's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> you should be able to go out and have a bite of ice cream and enjoy yourself once in a while too. You shouldn't be so sensitive that you can't tolerate any of these things any of the time. Yeah. Okay. Well, those are good advices. Thanks for that. And I wanted to ask you, so how is the brain connected to the gut? You mentioned that both message each other or they have a strong connection. Um, Mm -hmm. Could you clarify that connection for us, please? Yeah, so the gut-brain connection is this like hot topic right now, and rightfully so. I think it's a fascinating topic, but even institutions like Harvard, John Hopkins University, like very accredited medical institutions Mm -hmm. have recognized that yes, there is a gut-brain connection and your gut health can affect your mental health. Wow. And so that's pretty profound. What the connection actually is, is it's a physical connection, but then it's also connected chemically with messenger molecules. So the physical connection between the gut and the brain is largely the nervous system via the sympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve. Yeah. And the vagus nerve is part of the parasympathetic system, which we call rest and digest. And we call it rest and digest because you have to be in a parasympathetic state in order for your body to 
send out digestive enzymes, mm -hmm. stomach acid for peristalsis to happen, which is the movement of the intestines. We need to be in a relaxed state for all of this to happen, which is why mental health and gut health go hand in hand. If you're thinking that a tiger is going to be chasing you, meaning that your boss is driving you crazy or you're anxious about work the next day, you've got like the Sunday scaries, whatever it is, you're not going to be digesting your food well. So that physical connection between the vagus nerve really drives a lot of the digestive processes. Okay. And so I have a whole, I just came out with a gut health course with one commune, but there's a video on mindful eating and that's why it's important. You know, it's not just about meditation, but it's actually about activation of the vagus nerve so that you can digest, break down and absorb your food. So that's why we have to be really present with our food before we consume it. So I tell people, if you're not salivating before a meal, you're not ready. You're absolutely not ready. <laughs> you're not ready. Yeah. You're just not ready. You gotta, you gotta sit with it. You gotta look at it. You gotta smell it. You have to be present with it. The whole driving in the car, shoving something in your face while you're on a phone call, it just doesn't work for digestion. So a lot of people's issues can be solved with just mindful eating alone. Um, the other way that the gut and the brain are connected is through messenger molecules produced by your gut microbiome. Okay. So the gut microbiome is this whole ecosystem in the gut. And we have about 30 trillion human cells. We have about 39 trillion bacterial cells in the body. That's what something. this means, yeah, what this means is if you put out the numbers, we're about 43% human from a cellular perspective. Yes. Now, we have to look at genetics too because our genes code for proteins, which are the building blocks of life, right? We can go on and make our hormones from our genes. We can make um, different cytokines for our immune system. We make everything from our genetic material, right? Things that we got from mom and dad. And so when you look at this from a genetics perspective, we have about 20,000 human genes yep. from mom and dad. Now, from a microbial perspective, if you look at all the bacteria that reside within us, we have about two to 20 million microbial genes. So from this perspective, we're 1% human. So you have to start to wonder who's really driving the show here. Like who is truly driving the elephant? Is it us or is it our bacteria? And it's a combination of the two. So it's not one or the other, but these microbes have the ability to make proteins, which we've coined the term postbiotics, meaning that the bacteria is the biotic, it's the bacteria, and its product is a postbiotic. These postbiotics can then go interact with our human cells. They can cross over the gut barrier, go into our blood circulation, talk to our brain. So the gut microbiome actually modulates something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. And this BDNF has been you know, accredited for its ability to really increase mental performance, flow state, communication wow. between the hemispheres of the brain, and really up our performance. So the fact that our gut microbes way down here affect something up here, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, these microbes can also produce neurotransmitters. So they can produce things like GABA, which is our calming neurotransmitter. It makes us mm -hmm. feel at ease. Um, they can also produce other neurotransmitters. They regulate tryptophan levels, which is the precursor to serotonin. So there's a lot of things that happen that are just based on the microbes that reside within our gut yep. and then sending messenger molecules around our body to regulate metabolism and all of these other processes, a lot of which we don't even know yet. Wow. So yes, we know so much about the gut microbiome, but I really think that we know this much and we have like this much more to go, which is why yeah. I'm so excited about the research to come. But that's why it's important for your doctor to know about the research because I'm constantly looking up new studies of, you know, which probiotics are useful for which conditions because there's stuff coming out every single day about this. Yes, no, it's true. And if you just go to like the grocery store or the drugstore, they have all those probiotics and one is like for mood, one's for stress relief, one's for, and the bacteria profile, uh, microbacteria profile is very different. So I was looking at it and I'm like, that's very interesting. Like it, it can really affect different parts of what you're seeking, you know? So, yeah, yeah. And that's a common mistake. People, go, they go to the um, grocery store and they say, oh, you know, I got this going on. I just, I just need a probiotic. Nobody yeah. needs a probiotic. There's very few, you know, there's some probiotic strains that just like support the immune system. They have like general principles that could be good for anybody. Yeah. But it, 
I always tell people, let's target it. Like, what are you, what are your health goals? If your health goal is to heal constipation, the same probiotic HN0019 or whatever, the one that helps with natural killer cells in your immune system is not going to help with the constipation. So it's not like this broad spectrum, like, <laughs> yeah, just take a probiotic for gut Everything health. will be fine. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, you, you want to talk with somebody who knows the research or you know the yeah. research yourself and you know, hey, this strain has been studied to have this effect and that's why I'm going to take it. You would never take B12 for a vitamin D deficiency. And that's what I see happening with probiotics. There's just not enough right. um, literate people in the microbial space to be really educating people on that one's not going to help for that. So yes, you're taking it, but you're not going to get the out- outcome that you want. No. And I know that's like, that's very interesting. And it's fun that there's people like you that specializes in that because, you know, a lot of people go to their general practitioner doctor and that's all we have, right? We have general practitioner doctor. So we go there with all our issues. And like you said, they don't really know. So they shift you to a hormone specialist or they'll, they'll send you to whatever. And then like you said, everything's connected. And mm-hmm. I think that was one part, point that you mentioned I thought was very interesting is that you have to tap into the parasympathetic nervous system for digestion to be optimal. So let's say someone's really stressed all the time and really go, 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 go. They'll be in the sympathetic nervous system most likely. So they'll have bad digestions, right? So it could be just from that area of their life being not optimal or them being too stressed that they have poor digestion, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the majority of us right now, including myself. People are like, oh, you must do everything right because this is what you do. (laughs) This is what I do because I didn't do everything right. So I ended up here. Right. And so I'm constantly, you know, checking on myself. Like, did I sit down for a meal today or did I just see 12 patients straight and not feed myself or, you know, hydrate myself, things like that. So it's always, we're all in this together, but really I think we have to shift our societal beliefs on what's normal because the whole nine to five, you know, rat race of growing yeah. your business, yeah. doing Crazy. better. It's just not um, conducive to a, a healthy lifestyle. So we really have to cool. start to take control of our own lives and say, hey, I'm not subscribing anymore. I want to be able to sit down, have breakfast, have lunch, have dinner with my family, enjoy my food, create relationships that matter. Because that's kind of why we're all here. Yeah. So how do you balance that with your own self being a busy yeah. uh, practitioner? How do you make space for that uh, in your life? Yeah, and I would be completely lying if I said I had that under control at this point. Um, I'm still new in my career, and so I'm still trying to find the balance. So, you know, on a weekly basis, I'm kind of looking at my schedule from the week before saying, hey, was that good, or did I really burn the candle at both ends? And so Mm -hmm. I'm still working on something. But for me, what I've seen to be helping is that I'm really blocking off my time and saying, I actually don't want to spend time with, you know, these people anymore. It's not bringing joy to my life and really being really selective about how I do spend my time, um, both with, you know, patients, which I love seeing my patients and also with my personal life too, and trying to find a balance and really trying to schedule in personal time, because I think that there's nothing more therapeutic than sitting down to a meal with friends and laughing and enjoying other humans company. So I did that last night, you know, even though I had a full day of patience, I was like, I know that this is going to energize me more than it's, than it's going to drain me. And I think it's essential. So it's just kind of doing the best you can, but also looking back and saying, Hey, what did I do? Well, what did I do? Not so well last week to balance that parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Cause I don't think that the solution is to not have any stress. I actually think that we thrive on stress. Yes, I do. But like, I love the build, the grow, the feeling of like, I'm contributing to people's lives, but then you just have to have the rest and relaxation sector. Mm -hmm. So making sure we're kind of like helping ourselves through it, but being gentle and knowing that we're going to mess up and we're just trying our best as much as we can. Yeah. Are you a daily uh, meditation practitioner? Do you meditate daily? Yes. So I either do, um, Heart Math, have you heard of Heart Math by Inner? It's the Inner Balance device by Heart Math. They're okay. one of the leading kind of research groups for heart rate variability training. Oh. And so I like that because it's a biofeedback device that I clip onto my earlobe. Um, I'm looking at other HRV monitors too, and I use them with clients like the Whoop and the Aura, but I like this one because it's biofeedback. It actually gives you information as to whether your heart and your brain are in a coherent state or whether oh. they're not and how you can shift it. So I either use that on a daily basis or I love like my walking meditations, which 
I do every day, sometimes a couple of times per day, but really just checking in with myself, paying attention to the flowers, the water, all yeah. of that. So there's, there's some sort of meditation in my daily practice. Okay. Me, I use the Muse one. It's a headband and it calculates nice. your brain waves and it like yeah. feedbacks with audio if you're in that zone of being totally calm or not. So it trains you, you know, down the road. Yeah. So, Do you like it? Yeah, I really like it. It's really amazing. Yeah. It's because you have instant feedback. So, you know, mm -hmm. like, and then when your thoughts start wandering around then let's say there's okay. rain, it becomes crazier and crazier. And then yeah. oh, shit, you got to bring it back down and calm yourself. And then you hear little birds. So, you know, you're in yeah. the right zone. You're in the right spot. That's what I, yeah, I do like the biofeedback devices because yep. um, it also keeps me accountable because I'm so competitive that if I get a score at the end of something, I'm much more apt to do it than if I don't get a score. <laughs> so I can be like, oh, I scored better today or uh oh, I got to like really work on this because I'm going downhill. Yeah, no, that's awesome. You have a super great energy and it looks like you're like, <laughs> you're a high performer achiever like it's in you you know so yeah push for that so Thank that's you. awesome so uh coming back to the gut i wanted to know about the immune system how does the gut affect the immune system so for people that especially with the covid thing going on uh you know a strong immune system is always better than not mm -hmm. um, so yeah how can you boost your immune system just by the gut what would you recommend people do to in increase that yeah, and so when we talk about the gut, I really like talking about it as a terrain um, instead of anything else, just because it's really like the terrain of the gut, meaning your microbial composition has so much more to do with the health of the gut than anything else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, instead of like boosting immune system, we're really like supporting that terrain so that it can just handle whatever comes our way. And um, the gut and the immune system are intimately linked. About 70% of our immune kind of cells and everything reside right around the gut in the gut. So it's the gut associated lymphoid tissue. And this is an area rich of immune cells. And so we've got our T cells, our B cells, but the gut is also one of the places that is the first contact point with the outside world. So sometimes we think of the gut and we say it's inside of our body, right? Like your guts are inside. But the gut is actually a surface of the body. If you think about it, it's like a paper towel roll where the cardboard is actually technically on the outside, but it's just a hollow tube, right? So it's a continuous surface. So all the way from our anus, um, mouth to anus, is a tube. Yeah. And it is a surface that divides the outside world from the inside world. So it's the first point of contact that we have with some things like pathogens, bacteria that are in our food that we've consumed, that we've breathed in and kind of swallowed. Um, but it has to be a surface that's very well protected so that things don't come in. And so even with COVID, we know that ACE2 receptors, some of those are in the gut, and that's why we're seeing some people present with just diarrhea. Um, but there's always the chance that a virus can come in that way. Um, and then we get gastritis and gas I should say gastroenteritis where we have a viral infection or something. Yeah. So with all of those immune cells being around the gut, we really want to support that microbial composition so that it has a good relationship with our immune system. Okay. This is even more important when it comes to tolerance. And tolerance is the idea that we don't react to every single thing because then we would be sick mounting an immune response when we shouldn't be. So you wanna have tolerance to food or else you get food intolerances, right? Where you're reacting to healthy foods. And um, in order to do this, you wanna be able to produce anti-inflammatory compounds that help support the gut lining. And so we have these things called secretory IgA mo molecules and they're produced in the gut to help to capture any pathogens as well as to protect that gut lining from any inflammation that could then cause a breach in the gut barrier and then lead to something called you know leaky gut or intestinal permeability which is really where you see food intolerances develop in the first place so i'm not like huge into food intolerances because i think that the issue is gut integrity as the main okay. thing rather than the actual food being the main thing so i'm always looking from a terrain perspective like why do we have inflammation why does this person present with something like intestinal permeability and how do we heal that gut lining to support our immune system? There's even been certain probiotics that have been studied to boost things like natural killer cells. Your natural killer cells are one of the first lines of defense against viruses, things like coronavirus. 
And so certain probiotics can help support those natural killer cells directly. Um, so there's a whole host of ways that your gut is influencing your, um, your immune system, okay. but they're working in tandem. And a lot of it is messenger molecules, things of postbiotics, and then just the actual physical barrier of the gut. We have so many herbs in functional medicine and naturopathic medicine to help heal that gut lining, things like althea, which is marshmallow root. It's not the thing that you're roasting over the fire that's loaded with sugar, but marshmallow root itself is a very hard kind of plant that then you boil in water and you get this demulcent, like slimy, sticky <laughs> mixture yeah, okay. that is very, very healing to the GI tract. Wow. Glutamine is another um, amino acid that is healing yeah. to the colon specifically. And then you have things like calendula and you have things like chamomile and ginger that all can support the gut lining. Vitamin A is essential in gut healing as well as zinc. So you have all these things to really help support that gut lining and okay. support your immune system simultaneously. Wow. And I, I think that's, that's, that's really awesome. But I think what's great with you particularly is that you mix functional medicine with naturopathic and more like holistic uh, Mm -hmm. treatment and you mix both together so it gives you a better toolbox to help people fix their issues uh, when it comes to gut health so I think that's great that you have that, that open mind you know not to just stick to what you know and uh, that's that's really awesome and I think yeah. there should be more doctors from 2020 like you you know and I think we're gonna see more because we're more that generation than our grandparents yeah. generation when they were just <laughs> straight-minded but uh, yeah okay um, what I wanted to ask you, so what are your main clients? Who comes to you? Um, how can they come to you? And what would you say is the general treatment plan to start with? And I know that it's covered by insurance. I looked at your website and stuff. So that's great too for people to know that if they have an insurance plan, it can be covered. So. Yeah, if you live in California and if you have Medicare specifically, that's currently the only insurance that we're taking. So okay. it's a smaller subset. Um, unfortunately, the insurance model just isn't built for integrative medicine because we spend so much more time with our patients, but it's yeah. frustrating on everybody's behalf, including the doctors, patients. <laughs> um, but basically, our practice is set up, so we're about 95% virtual. So we do a lot of Zoom calls with people, and then I see people in person in Los Angeles as well as San Diego. Yep. Um, a lot of people are coming to us with gut issues. So things like IBS, reflux, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's colitis, um, things like that. And then we're working with them from an adjunctive perspective. So we're not taking the role of the gastroenterologist, but instead giving them a different lens, a different viewpoint, and a second opinion, and supporting them with nutrition, exercise, lifestyle changes, vitamins, minerals, herbs. And then there's a sector of our practice where we do hormone balancing for men and women. So we deal with a lot of men with low testosterone levels, perimenopausal, menopausal women that are looking to really support just like lifespan, longevity, feeling better on a daily basis. And then we also deal with premenopausal women, just balancing their cycles, period problems, all of that good stuff. Okay. Um, and then separately, we've got our anti-aging wing of the practice where these people are healthy. They just want to see where they're at, get a baseline, become healthier. Um, okay. So we have a lot of different options for people to interact with us, but those are the main facets that we use. Okay. And um, to get in contact with you, would they go by, because I know you have a consultation, well, you work for a consultation company called Modern, um, or would they just go on the website for the Institute of Functional Medicine and get in contact with you through there? Yeah. So IFM will direct you to Modern Med. So okay. you're going to end up at www. M O D R N M E D.com. Yeah. So there's no E in modern and you can schedule a complimentary consult with one of our doctors to see, you know, what it would look like being in our practice. Um, if you're out of state, out of country, it looks more, it looks different. Um, we're, we're working as a health consultant or a health coach um, okay. versus being in California, Colorado, the licensed states that we're actually practicing within um, but we can help people no matter what, just looks a little bit differently. So you can schedule a complimentary call or you can email and we can just set you up with an initial consult and dive right into your health. Wow. So for our Canadian listeners, uh, they can reach out to you and you'll be able to set them up or somebody will be able to set them up with a consultation. And I Absolutely. think the first consultation is free, right? To just get an assessment of what they need. 
Yeah. So it's the, that's the 10 to 15 minute complimentary call. Yep. It's a phone call or zoom if it's out of um, country. Yep. Um, and we're just kind of going over the structure of our practice, what to expect and if we would be a good fit for you. And if we, yep. we aren't, then sometimes we know somebody that would be, so we could refer you to another practice as well, but we just want to make sure that we can help you with what your goals are and kind of tell you what the process would be like. Okay. And that's a question I always like to ask. Uh, what's your biggest success story? Like, did you fix Crohn's disease or something really like amazing that you're like, wow, you know, this, this blows my mind. And then your biggest failure, something you tried that just didn't totally. work while grow, like growing into that practice and you know, acquiring the skills that you have now. Yeah, absolutely. So success story. Yeah. Um, it's probably not my biggest one, but the, it's one that happened this week. And so it's just wow. fresh in my mind. But we, yeah. I, I just launched the gut health course with Commune. And so it's a yeah. 10 day program. I like put every piece of knowledge I could find into it. It's definitely like my little baby right now that <laughs> I'm nurturing and really just excited about and proud of. And I had a woman who took the, the gut health course reach out and she told me that she has had chronic constipation for 20 plus years of her life, has been to a million doctors. She just took the gut health course. She didn't talk to me even one-on-one -on -one as a patient and she yes. no longer has constipation or any gut issues. So that for me was just like such amazing. an amazing feeling that I can help people um, even outside of my, my medical practice with really just empowering people with education and information about nutrition and mm -hmm. supplementation and things like that. So that was a good one. Um, the, the opposite side, biggest failure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when, yeah, so I'm an entrepreneur. I have a business too. Yeah. And so when you're in that side of things, you fail on a daily basis. So For it's sure. just like, which one do I pick? Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. I mean, I've, I've started a company that totally, totally failed. And okay. so I would say that's probably one of my bigger ones. Um, with <laughs> patients, I don't view them as failures necessarily. If no. somebody's not getting better, it more just gives us information. So, you know, if they didn't do well in a certain treatment, it actually starts to cross things off of the list of that, like things that are causing it. Um, so I really view those more as journeys than yeah. anything else, but I've had tons of business failures. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was your biggest failure in, in business? Like, what did you try to start up that just didn't work out? I'm, I'm just curious. If you want yeah, to it, was a, it. it was a self-development company. It okay. probably will at some time take hold. Um, but I was excited. I had just started my medical practice and I started this separate company with yeah. another group of individuals. And it's very hard to start a business with multiple people, which is what okay. I've realized. Yeah. And so I think it was just the communication, but also that we, we all had multiple businesses going. And that's something that I've learned over the years is just like focus and attention on one thing is so much more valuable than trying to spread yourself so thin. And yeah. so that was my big takeaway with that is like, Hey, I love what I'm doing with this business. I'm just going to really focus on it because I'm helping so many people and it brings me joy and puts me in the flow state. Like you don't need to do a million different businesses. No, and I think that's a good point, especially like I have a lot of friends that are entrepreneur. I'm a little entrepreneur myself. And that's the thing that you usually do. You try to do too much instead of just mastering one thing at a time and getting like the best results that you can with that area. So I think that's yeah. that's a good takeaway. So that's a good thing to learn. Yeah, I know. So if I didn't learn it then, I probably would have like three okay businesses right now yeah. versus like I learned it early and I was like, wow, that was not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And you just launched your course. So congrats on that. I saw it on one commune. I think you had a few days for free and then you could sign up for the whole course, get you into yeah. it. So that's another thing that people, if they just want to know more about their, you know, their gut health and learn without, you know, consulting or without going to your practice necessarily, they can sign up for the course. So that's on one commune.com if I'm correct. Yep. Yeah. And, and you can also go to modern med and it'll take you there as well. Um, okay. but it's a great way to interact with me and kind of see how I practice without actually working with me. Um, yeah. kind of just to get a feel of functional medicine too, and really just deep dive into gut health. So we go into the microbiome, we go into fecal transplants, we go into helminthic therapy, which is like an immune therapy as well. Talking about like how worms actually can affect your immune system. So we go into oh. all of these amazing categories and really just educate people on how your gut should work yeah. and what it needs to function optimally. 
Okay. And one question I had is uh, about fecal transplantation. Like I read that and I was like, how does that work? Like you just take, you know, feces from somebody else and swap it. Like I was like, I I need more explanation on that because that seems to be one of the treatment that might work for some people, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's actually coronavirus is kind of putting a wrench on all this because it possibly can be transmitted through the feces yeah. as well. So, but the, it's the idea that you're taking feces, so stool from a healthy donor. So they have good. really good digestion. They don't have any immune conditions. They're metabolically fit. So yep. you're taking their donor stool and they've already been um, screened, blood yep. tests. They've been seen by a doctor. They've gone through the whole entire thing. And, and then you're taking their stool and you're actually infusing it, typically rectally via enema, um, into somebody who has a gut condition like ulcerative colitis or C. difficile infection, which is a life-threatening infection. Um, yeah. Or there's been other studies done for different things. The only thing in the United States right now, which is actually different than Canada, but the United States, it's only yeah. approved for C. diff infections, where in Canada... It's, it has a broader scope there, I believe, because okay. um, there's, there's an institution called Taymont in Canada that I'll send people to sometimes. Um, okay. But basically, the idea is to really shift the terrain, meaning shift the microbial composition of the colon and of the microbiome so that you're getting more anti-inflammatory postbiotics coming out versus inflammatory ones, and really trying to shift the ecosystem to improve immune function, improve tolerance, and improve gut symptoms. So there's been some great results with IBD, specifically ulcerative colitis with FMT, um, and we're looking more into IBS and other conditions that may help with it. There's been mice models Um, done that actually show that if you take a lean mouse, infuse a lean mouse's feces into an overweight mouse, the overweight mouse loses weight and vice versa. Wow. Put an overweight mouse's feces into a lean mouse, the lean mouse gains weight. And so it's showing that- That's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. And showing that the metabolic capabilities of the microbiome are definitely there. What I believe is the missing link right now in FMT is that we have to identify- and paint a picture of what is the optimal microbiome. And we don't know the answer to that yet. So it's like we have to find these super donors that their stool exerts these incredible health effects that we're trying to accomplish, whether it's to decrease inflammation in colitis um, or whether it's to induce a metabolic change in people with obesity that's resistant to weight loss. Wow, that's amazing. (laughs) Super donor stool, that's what we're calling (laughs) it. Super donor stools. Yeah. So I just want to respect the time that you allowed me to have with you today. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is a great short podcast, but it's amazing. You've provided a lot of uh, information for our listeners. Uh, do you have one last thing you'd like to share with the audience in regards to maybe optimal health or any, any messages you'd like to send out there? My, my big message usually surprises people because I really believe that the, your body has the innate ability to heal itself. And so really altering your thoughts and your beliefs around your health is the best place to start. So really just believing in your body and its capabilities to helping you, um, I think is one of the biggest things that you can do to impact your physical health. So it's that mind, brain, body connection that I really like to instill upon people. Um, But I also want to just thank you for having me. And, you know, I look forward to to you. (laughs) coming on again and I appreciate both you and your wife and everything for reaching out. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I'll put all the description and the links um, on all the podcast platform. It's going to be on YouTube as well. So for people to be able to reach out to you or the Institute of Functional Medicine, because there's other practitioners too. So, um, but I'd rather you go with her because she's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) And I'll put that link to the one commute uh, uh, course that you put online. So Thank Thank you you so much. And thanks for being on the podcast. It's been very interesting. And I wish you a beautiful day. Thanks a lot, Dr. Mary Party. Yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate you guys. Have an awesome day. Thanks. We'll be in touch. Bye.